رحم الله من قرأ سورة الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين يا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها النبي لما تحرم ما أحل الله لك تبتغي مرضات أزواجك والله غفور رحيم The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman. Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The verse in question, verse 1 of chapter 66 of the Holy Quran, discusses an incident known as the incident of Maghafir, an incident which requires an in depth examination. <clears throat> For it is an incident that affects the marital life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As we know, the Qur'an is replete with stories concerning prophets of God and their wives. The aims of these stories is for us to dissect them in order that we are able to apply the lessons from their behavior in those marriages into our lives. As in when you open the Qur'an, you'll find that many of the prophets who are mentioned in the Qur'an, their wives are mentioned alongside them. Nabi Adam, for example, his wife is mentioned alongside him. Nabi Nuh alayhi salam, his wife is mentioned alongside him. You'll find Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, his wives are mentioned alongside him. You find for example when it comes to Nabi Musa alayhi salam, his wife is mentioned as well. And likewise the Holy Prophet when the Quran examined his life, you find that there are a number of verses which discuss his relationship with his wives in his life. As in you find that when you look at these verses, you find that these verses give us an indication of what Rasulullah went through in his marriages. And the aim of the Quran when examining these stories was to highlight to us that even the greatest of personalities are tested in their marriages. What do we mean? We mean that when you look at people like Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, or you look at Prophet Lut alayhi salam, or you look at Prophet Musa alayhi salam, or the Holy Prophet, you'll find that each and every one of them was tested in their marriage. As in it was an indication for us in our lives, that do not be surprised if one of the tests I give you as a human being, is a test in your marital relationship. Because sometimes someone, when he's going through a test with his wife, sometimes they think that the test is as if it's only affecting them. As in the grass is always greener on the other side. You look at your friends' relationships and you're like, look at the two of them. They're probably so happy. There are probably no problems between them at all. Everything's going smoothly for them. 
And then you actually begin to realize that no, later on when you find out about a particular couple who broke up, you ask yourself and you think they broke up, as in from the grass looks green on the other side. Therefore you found that when you look within the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to highlight that even my most beloved creations, even they were tested in their marriages. Do not think that you'd pass without a test in your marriage, as in you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our own lives is either going to test us with our health or with our wealth or with our education or with our family relationships. That's a set rule in the Quran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a set rule that each and every one of you, irrespective if you're my greatest prophet or if you're a normal human being who never received risala, you will still be tested in one area or the other. And that's why when we examine Rasulullah's marriage, it is vital for us to understand that when we say Rasulullah is an uswa, he is an example for us, the meaning is that whatever he behaved with his wives is the way we should behave with our wives, isn't it? As in when I follow Rasulullah, Quran says that the Prophet said, if you love Allah, follow me, Allah will love you. Meaning what? Meaning for us to receive the pleasure of Allah, it's vital we look at the biography of the Prophet in every area. His public life, his private life, each area we have to scrutinize. Rasulullah is not infallible only in his public life. No. Rasulullah is infallible in his private life as well. Which means every act that he performed is an act guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, let's examine this particular verse for the incident is known as the incident of Maghafir. Let's ask the following questions. Number one, why did Rasulullah marry so many wives? As it wasn't one enough for him in his life. Number two, why does the verse say, O Prophet of God, why do you prohibit for yourself what we have made lawful for you? Number three, how many times did the wives of Rasulullah act rudely towards him? And how many times would he keep showing love back towards them? Number four, did Ali ibn Abi Talib in his life ever disrespect Fatima al-Zahra? And if he didn't, then why is there a narration that Rasulullah became angry with him over his behavior with Fatima? Number five, Abi Abdullah, how many wives did he marry? And what was the background of each of these wives at Karbala? Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. Many times non-Muslims ask a clear question when they hear about the Prophet. Why did the man marry so many wives? As in straight away you find in medieval Europe, Rasulullah was looked down upon because of this reason. If you look at medieval European literature, you'll find they used to call Muhammad, they used to say he is the Mahound. The Mahound means the devil incarnate. And that's why if you look at Dante, the divine comedy, within the divine comedy, there is that stage known as the Inferno, Dante's Inferno. The Inferno, you look at the levels of hell, isn't it? They used to say that when he traveled to the lowest pit of hell, he saw two men, Muhammad bin Abdullah and Ali bin Abi Talib. In medieval Europe, these two men in particular, notice he doesn't see anyone else. To him, nobody else in that religion is worth even talking about. Muhammad bin Abdullah and Ali bin Abi Talib says, I saw them at the bottom of hell. You found that they used to have the worst of images of Rasulullah because of his marriages. Even if you go to YouTube today, you'll type in the Prophet, you'll find videos about how Muhammad was a man of lust. Muhammad the pedophile. You find all of these on YouTube, videos being produced. If you ask our people, can you explain the marriages of Rasulullah? I find many of them saying to tell you the truth. I don't even know half the ladies he married. I know her and her and her, but after that, I don't, don't have a clue. And even if I know who she is, I don't know why he married her. Our generation has to be a generation that is able to be a knowledgeable generation. Because the way the media is working today, unless we have knowledge, then these types of misconceptions will continue. You found that when someone asks, why did the Prophet marry, for example, nine wives? Whenever you want to answer, how do you answer? There's a division. What do we mean? We mean that when you look at the Prophet's life, you have to divide the Prophet's life into the following. Zero to 25. 25 to 51. 51 to 63. 
Zero to 25. Is he married to anyone in his life? No. As in all the other Arab youth were getting married 18, 17, 16, 19. In those days, it was normal to get married very young. He did not get married to anyone up until the age of 25. From 25 until 51, he married only one lady. For 26 years, he was with her and her alone where he was highlighting that polygamy isn't a norm in Islam. Monogamy is a norm. What do I mean? I mean, today, sometimes a person comes and says, you're allowed four wives because your Quran says it. We reply, hold on. If it was the case that four wives are normal, then my prophet, when he was married to Khadija for 26 years, would have married others, isn't it? Rasulullah highlighted polygamy. Marrying more than one wife is not normal. No, it was for a particular context. The context was that when the Muslims who went to Badr or who went to the battle of Uhud, let's say, these men lose their lives. Their wives are sitting at home. They become widows. As in Islam in those days was not 1.6 billion people. Islam in those days was a handful of people. If now my husband's gone to war and I'm a widow sitting there, who's going to look after me? We're only a pocket of Muslims. So you'd find the Quran allowed you to marry one, two, three or four on the indication that of course you treat them all equally justice in terms of time justice in terms of monetary expenses there's another verse in the quran which says but you'll never be able to treat them justly no that means in terms of love you can never say i love her 61 percent and i love her 39 no what you do is that there's monetary expenses and there are times which you spread with them so Rasulullah, 26 years from the age of 25 till 51, he was with Khadija. The other marriages happened between 51 and 63. Tell me, if I'm in my 20s, in my 30s, in my 40s, wouldn't I get married to many ladies then? Wouldn't you think it's the prime of my youth? Rasulullah would only be with Khadija 26 years. Then from the age of 51 till 63, he married the other wives. Why? None of those other wives he married because of love for them. No. Only Khadija, she was the only one in his life who you would say he wanted to marry her. The others he did to establish a law of God on earth. What do I mean? I mean, if you look at the other marriages, for example, when he married Zainab bin Jahsh, Zainab bin Jahsh had been married to his adopted son, Zaid. They didn't get along with each other. When they didn't get along with each other, what happened? She divorced Zaid. In those days, you were not allowed to marry the ex-wife of your adopted son. Not allowed. In Arabian culture, the ex-wife of the adopted son, you could not marry her. So what happened was, Allah ordered the Prophet, marry Zainab, to remove this cultural taboo. If my adopted son divorced, my, uh, uh, divorced his wife, and then they, that wife, why is there a black cross on her that she can't get married again? You go and marry her to remove that taboo. Zainab bin Jahash example. Another example, Um Salama, for example. Um Salama was a widow. In those days, widows, people would rarely marry them. There was a taboo on them. Nobody to look after Um Salama. Even some narrations mention Um Salama was very old when he married her. You found that he married her in order to safeguard this widow. Aisha, at the young age. Sometimes people say, yes, it was a nine-year-old marriage. If you look at many of the conclusive discussions, you'll find she was much older than nine years of age. And I have a lecture from 2006 where I have dissected the age of this issue in depth. You find that Aisha, when you married her, why? Her tribe was a prominent tribe. You found that Rasulullah's tribe was a prominent tribe. The aim was what? The aim was let's try and hopefully bring the tribes together to bring them towards the religion of Islam. Um Habiba, the daughter of Abu Sufyan. Why marry the daughter of Abu Sufyan? Because that daughter of Abu Sufyan, there's no way her dad will let her practice Islam. There's no way he'll let her in the house. You marry her to provide her a protection within your own home. In other words, those marriages between 51 to 63, Allah had ordered him to marry in order to establish certain cultural or religious practices. And that's why you find that what was the norm? The norm was that Rasulullah would stay with Khadija, as in he himself said, no wife comes near my wife Khadija. Why? Because he saw the best manners from Khadija. No wife ever replicated Khadija's manners. He saw a lady who her wealth helped the religion of Islam. 
On many occasions, he'd remember Khadija. When Khadija died, it was only then that he married his other wives. Now, of course, when he marries these other wives, it's important to understand something. That when he marries these other wives, he has to, of course, allot them the time periods, isn't it? So if you've married four wives, you have to have a day with one, a day with the other, a day with the third, a day with the fourth. If I spend a hundred dollars on one, I have to spend a hundred dollars on the second, a hundred on the third, a hundred on the fourth. So it has to be timed. This incident which I'm talking about was related to a source of jealousy between two wives against another. What happened? Rasulullah used to go to the house of Zainab. Remember I mentioned Zainab, she was married to his adopted son originally. He used to go to her house. When he'd go to her house, Hafsa, daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Aisha, daughter of Abu Bakr, Aisha came to Hafsa and said, the man spends time with this lady. As in he gives her the time of day and he spends too much time with her. And she makes him this honey drink. The best thing for us to do is that when he comes home next time to one of us, let's tell him that his breath smells bad. Go to Imam al-Bukhari al-Sahih. Go to every book you want on the tafsir of Surah 66 verse 1. That they plotted, they said he spends time in Zainab's house. When he spent that time, they said, how comes he spends time in her house? And they knew that he used to love two things. He used to love the sweets and the honey. Especially when you brought the two of them together. So the two of them, Aisha and Hafsa, what did they do? They said, listen, he spends time with her. That jealousy came into them. They said, we'll go and tell Sauda, who was another of his wives, that when he comes to visit her, and when he visits Hafsa, when he enters straight away, say, your breath smells bad. And when he's come to a few of us, the last of us will cover our nose even before he talks to tell him about how bad his breath smells. As in sometimes you see these manners, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable how a man can live with Rasulullah and behave like this with him. So Rasulullah was in the house of Zainab. In that house, he'd have a drink. It was a honey drink. And within the drink, maghafir would be placed. Someone says, what is maghafir? There used to be a tree called the Arfat tree. The Arfat tree, some of the tree was a sap. It would come out of the tree called maghafir. That sap, you mix it with honey, it gives a sweet taste. But the idea was that although the taste is sweet, the smell that comes out may be bad. Like garlic. Garlic, the taste is beautiful. But the smell, destructive. So you find here that Rasulullah, what happened? Rasulullah would take that maghafir. When he'd take the maghafir, he went to the house of Sauda and went to the house of Hafsa. When he entered their houses, you know what they did? Straight away, as soon as he entered, they straight away said, your, your breath smells so bad. He looked at them, he said, why? He said, you we're smelling, it's not nice at all. He said, then forgive me, you know, I will not drink that drink again. It must be the maghafir drink that I drank that makes the smell bad. He went to Hafsa's house. Hafsa looked at him and said, your smell, move, your smell. He looked at her and said, very well, I will not drink that drink again. Rasulullah was saddened, as in, and naturally anybody would be saddened. You'd be saddened if, for example, Rasulullah, you'd be saddened if Rasulullah, or if any of you, someone came and told you bad breath, each and every one of us would be saddened. You wouldn't want someone to say you've got bad breath like that, would you? You found that Rasulullah, the moment this was said to him, the narrations, what do they mention? <clears throat> the narrations mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse. O oh, Prophet of God, why do you prohibit for yourself what I've allowed for you? You want to please your wives? Don't worry about pleasing them. What they say to you is not true. Your breath is the nicest of breaths of any human being. You see the man, what happened was when he'd go to their houses, instead of welcoming him, instead of showing good manners towards him, Aisha, Hafsa would plot that the best thing to do to this man is make fun of his breath. 
And that's why Ibn Abbas narrates, Ibn Abbas narrates about the same incident, the incident of Maghafir. Ibn Abbas narrates, I saw Umar ibn al-Khattab at the time of Hajj. We traveled towards Hajj. I asked him, who was the verse revealed about on the incident of the bad breath? Who was it? He said, Umar ibn al-Khattab at the beginning did not want to answer me. We were coming back from Hajj. I poured wudu. He poured his wudu. The wudu was finished. I said, Oh Umar, who is the one who made fun of Rasulullah's breath like that? Who was it? He said, it was my daughter Hafsa and Abu Bakr's daughter Aisha. Then he looked. He looked straight away at Ibn Abbas. He said, Oh Ibn Abbas, let me tell you something. When we men were in Quraysh, we were so strong above our women. When we went to Medina, these Medinite women were stronger than the men. He goes, I was in the house of Umayyah. And while I was in the house of Umayyah, my wife one day back chatted me. I turned around to her and I said to her, how dare you back chat me like that? I'm your husband. She said, if the wives of Rasulullah can back chat the prophet of God, why can't I back chat you? True. If the wives of Rasulullah can back chat. So do you know what he did? He straight away said, I'm leaving the house. He said, I went to the house of my daughter. I said, is it true that you back chat the prophet? Is it true that you hurt him with your language? She said, yes, it's true. He said, do you not know that anyone who hurts Rasulullah, even if it's his wife, Allah will punish her. Now listen to his lines. Even if you're the wife of the prophet, if you hurt the feelings of Rasulullah, God will punish you. And that's why you found that this particular incident, Allah said in the Quran, what? Allah highlighted that wasn't the only time they showed rudeness to him. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was trying to highlight for us. That Rasulullah, he's the greatest of prophets. But even he had to be patient with wives who were rude to him. A couple of verses later, Surah 66. and Surah 66, all it does is talk about wives of the prophets. Either the Prophet Muhammad or the prophets before him. A couple of verses later, the Quran says, you think that's the only rudeness? Again, look at again how the both of them, two. It's always talking about two. How the both of them again are rude to him. The Quran says, وَإِذْ أَسَرَ النَّبِيُّ لَا بَعْضِ أَزْوَاجِ حَدِيثًا فَلَمَّا نَبَّدْ بِي وَأَرَضَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ You find that the verse, what does it say? The verse says, the Prophet told and divulged the secret to his wife. Then his wife went and told her friend. When the Prophet told her, why did you tell your friend? She replied to him, who told you that I told her? As the man's been receiving revelations for 20 years, there's a link which is quite strong who might tell him. The reply was, Allah has told me. You know, the Prophet told one of his wives, he told Hafsa a secret. Again, she went and told Aisha. And I ask all of you, brothers and sisters, this very fundamental question. What was the secret that Rasulullah gave to, A to Hafsa which she told Aisha? That needs a lecture for another day. Because that will open up another discussion which needs another event. What is it that the Quran says? The Prophet told his wife a secret. She went and told her friend. He told her, why did you tell your friend? She said, who told you? He said, Allah. Then the Quran verse 4. In Tatuba, speaking about two of them. In tatuba ila Allah faqad faqad qulubukuma wa in tadahara alayh fa inna Allah wa mawla wa jibreelu wa salih al mu'mineen What does the Quran say? If two of you ask Allah for repentance then Allah is willing to forgive both of you If you don't and you think you can gang up on Muhammad then know that Allah protects Muhammad Jibreel protects Muhammad and salih al mu'mineen which refers to Amir al mu'mineen will protect Muhammad then the next verse, what does it say? Asa Rabbuhu in Talaka Kunna Yubdila was watching Khairam Min Kunna Muslimat, Mu'minat, Qanita, Taibat, Abidat, Saiha, Tayibat, Abkara. What does the verse say? If Allah wants to, He'll tell His Prophet Muhammad divorce both of them. 
What, you think we can't replace you with better wives? Your normal wives. You're like any other wives. If you're obedient, we love you. If you're disobedient, then you have to pay. When the Quran says this in verse 5, do you know what level these people's rudeness must have reached? Isn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doesn't Allah always say that the act which is halal, but most look down upon is divorce, isn't it? The act which is halal, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks down upon it if someone acts it is divorce. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he tells the Prophet, if don't worry, if you want, I'll divorce them for you and I'll give you better than them. That highlighted that the manners of these two in the eyes of Allah was the worst manners that you'll ever see. And that's why five verses later, brothers and sisters, only five verses, Surah 66, verse number 10, Quran says, we have given an example, Allah has given an example to those who kuffar, the wife of Nuh, the wife of Lut. They were both married to prophets of ours, but they died as disbelievers. Why, Ya Allah, do you need to mention this, that they died as disbelievers? Why? As then, you don't need to tell me about Prophet Nuh and Prophet Lord. This is Prophet Muhammad. No. He was making it clear, whoever you're married to, the way you end your life is more important than how you married the man. If you married the man full of love for the religion, make sure you don't go to the grave with hatred for the religion. If you married the man respecting his in-laws, don't go to the grave fighting his in-laws. Isn't it? As in the Quran, what was it saying? The Quran was saying even the Prophet Muhammad, the embodiment of akhlaq. And look at the akhlaq of this man. Rasulullah sets an example for all of us in this verse. What does he show us? He shows us, they told me my breath smells bad. If my breath truly smells bad, then I'll stop drinking that drink or eating that food. Why? I will stop eating the maghafi or the sap or drinking it with honey. Why? Because at the end of the day, I took this lady from her dad's house. I have to show akhlaq to her like she has to show akhlaq to me. Today, that same concept of breath can still exist. Don't worry. As in when your wife tells you, listen, I beg you brush your teeth. No, brush your teeth. As in you go days without brushing them, your teeth look shiny. But not shiny white teeth, they look shiny yellow. Go, go brush them. You find, yes, inshallah, inshallah, I'll brush them, I'll brush them. Have you cooked my food? Hold on a minute. You want your rights all looked after. Whereas the rights of your wife, that when you come near her, your breast smells nice. How many times? Ask the sisters. The sisters ask them, how many times you tell your husband, I beg you, stop when you come to near me. Don't smoke just before you've come near me. As in your mouth smells like Marlboro cigarettes. The whole mouth. You'd think that the guy's just been smoking. When you come near me, have the best of breath. Rasulullah, these two made fun of him. You'd think he can turn around to them and say, how dare you, I'm the prophet of God. Nobody can come near me. No. If my breath doesn't smell nice, I'm willing to stop and I will not have that. Likewise, Rasulullah was then asked by the woman. He was asked, Ya Rasulullah, what is our jihad? When we today see you men going on the battlefield, Ya Rasulullah, we see you and you've got martyrdoms and sacrifices. I as a wife, what's my sacrifice, what's my jihad? He said, good manners with your husband is the jihad of the wife. Notice he didn't say, good manners with the husband is the responsibility. No, it's a jihad. Because sometimes the husband may be someone very stubborn to deal with. Your jihad is your manners. The reason for many issues today is what? Is that yes, the sisters will complain that the husbands aren't honoring our rights. But at the same time, sometimes you can be rude with that tongue and destroy the relationship. Because today when you ask someone, and you hear these cases many times, why are you two hating each other? Well, you know what? I was wrong. I was rude to her. But she was also rude to me. No, I wasn't rude to him. I didn't say anything. All I did was attack his mom. What do you mean attack his mom? I said, you really think attacking his mom is going to make him... Oh, mashallah, keep attacking my mom. I'm enjoying your attack. <laughs> Quran, what did it highlight? Quran said, in the same way Muhammad showed akhlaq to his wife, likewise the wife has to show akhlaq back to the husband. That the jihad of the wife is what? The jihad of the wife is that she maintains manners within the house. Someone says, why? Because those kids look at your two, you two's behavior. 
Children at home, look at you two. If they see the husband cursing all day long, and they see the mother backbiting him all day long, those children will be affected. As in, don't think those children don't see. Those children, they learn more than we learn. Everything they pick up on. How many times has your child come up to you and said, why did you say that to mom? They pick up. Or the child will say to mom, mom, why did you speak like that to dad? You find when Islam said, maintain the manners within the house, Rasulullah knew. Rasulullah knew every act he gives back to Aisha or Hafsa, a child in the house will pick up on the act. Likewise, every act they give, a child in the house will pick up on the act. And that's why you found Rasulullah, it wasn't only then. Again in the Quran you find that when Rasulullah came back from Khaybar, they heard that the spoils of Khaybar were given out to the people. They came back to Rasulullah. They said to Rasulullah, how comes all the ladies of Medina get the spoils of Khaybar and we don't? This happened to Rasulullah. Rasulullah said, you are the wives of a prophet. You're meant to be the height of humility. Yet you come and you speak to me in this way. But you never see Rasulullah raising his arm like some followers of Ahlul Bayt are raising their arms. Brothers, it's an act of cowardice when a man hits a woman. Religion, it's not allowed, but it's an act of a coward to hit a woman. Today, do you know how many cases we have in our communities of men hitting their wives, brothers and sisters? There's going to be a day, Allah, everything will speak, our hands will speak, our eyes will speak. When today you see people hitting their wives, did Rasulullah hit her when she said his breath is bad? He said, I'll stop drinking that. I'll stop eating that. Did he slap her? Did he pick up something and hit her? Today in our communities, do you know how many women are being abused physically? And the man will turn around and say, yes, but she was rude to me. She's rude to you, then separate. Have a period where you have dialogue with each other, stay away from each other. But for a man who claims to follow Rasul Allah, hits his wife, no. And unfortunately, these increases in physical abuse are continuing. Every community you go to, there's a case of physical abuse and a lady has to put up with it. When Rasulullah said jihad of the woman is that she has good akhlaq, not good akhlaq in front of physical abuse. Physical abuse, you see physical abuse, you speak. Don't have good akhlaq. Speak! Physical abuse has no place in this religion. Therefore, what did you see Rasulullah? He was highlighting that even I, when these two plot against me, when these two, I give them a secret, they tell each other, did I ever once smack my wife? Did I ever once hit my wife? Did I ever once beat my wife? Then why is it you who say, Ashhadu anna Muhammad and Rasulullah willing to slap and hit and beat? And that's why you find that this lady, Aisha, you would think that when seeing a man with such akhlaq, you would think she would be respectful from that day onwards. When he said, I will not drink the maghafir or I won't eat it, you would think that she would say, Subhanallah, this man is the height of humility. No! When Mary the Coptic, when Rasulullah married her, intense jealousy against Mary the Coptic. Jealous that Mary the Coptic gave Rasulullah Ibrahim. There were only two women in Rasulullah's life who gave him children. Khadija and Mary the Coptic. Mary the Coptic gave him Ibrahim. The intense jealousy towards her that there's even a narration which I don't even want to go into because the member of Al Muhammad is the member scrutinized around the world today. Sometimes the speaker has to hold back. But I leave you to do your research. Sometimes a person has to think of his fellow brothers around the world. But anyway, you found that this lady, you would think she would maintain respect for Rasulullah. No. That respect, that akhlaq, he had to bear patience. And that's why many Muslims were saddened when they saw her lead the battle of the camel against Ali bin Abi Talib. Many Muslims. Many Muslims could not believe you are the wife of Rasulullah. Akhlaq is meant to be your name. You were brought up in the house of revelation. And she leads an army against Amir al muminin in that battle, the battle of the camel. Go, all of you, every single person in this hall. Type, battle of camel. Aisha, Talha and Zubair versus Ali bin Abi Talib, Ammar bin Yasir, Hassan and Hussein. And you know what they say to you? They say to you that they all loved each other. It was a Yemeni Jew who caused the problem between them. Blame everything on the Jew. Typical. Nothing's changed. And that's why you find that when Ali ibn Abi Talib was the fourth Khalifa, he expected this lady, she's the wife of Rasulullah. He expected her to treat him with respect, not to come out with an army against him. 
But Amir al muminin still made clear that even though she's come out with an army against me, the fact that she was the wife of Rasulullah means we show akhlaq. I don't have to agree with her opinions, no. But we show akhlaq, and when we show akhlaq, what do we do? We remember that this lady was in the house of Rasulullah. And that's why today when there are certain speakers in the Shia world who have the audacity to say that the wife of Rasulullah committed adultery, this is disgusting. Disgusting. Rasulullah's wife, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never allow Rasulullah to be embarrassed like this. Never. Today on YouTube, you have people who say Rasulullah's wife was an adulteress. This has nothing to do with the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. And not everybody who claims to represent Ahlul Bayt is necessarily a representative. But we admit, yes, she came out. She fought Ali ibn Abi Talib. She was willing to end the army of Ali ibn Abi Talib and destroy them. That was there. Nobody can deny this. Nobody can deny this. So what do you find? You find even Shaykh al-Mufid. Shaykh al-Mufid, what does the word Mufid mean? Mufid means useful, isn't it? If an Arab is here, they will tell you, when you say someone is Mufid, it means they are useful. Do you know how he got the name Mufid? Through the debate about the battle of the camel. That's how he got the name Mufid. The debate concerning the battle of the camel. Shaykh al-Mufid's teacher said to him, go to the lesson of one of the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah. Go to his lesson, sit down, and listen to his lesson. Shaykh al mufid entered, the alim was there. When the alim was there, the alim was giving a lesson, which while he's giving the lesson, someone asked the question. Salamu alaykum Mawlana, alaykum as -salam. Mawlana, what is greater? The event of Ghadir or the event of the cave when Abu Bakr was in the cave? The Mawlana said, the event of the cave is greater than the event of Ghadir. Shaykh al-Mufid was sitting down quietly. At this stage, his name wasn't Mufid. He's just watching. He said to Mawlana, why? He said, because the event of the cave when Abu Bakr was with the Prophet in the cave in the Quran. And the event of Ghadir is in Hadith. And the Quran goes above Hadith because the recognized event always goes above the narrated event. Shaykh al-Mufid put his hand up. He said, excuse me, I have a question. What do you say about Muslims who fight the Imam of their time? What's their position? He said, they're not allowed. He said, what's their position? He said, they end up as disbelievers. He said, okay, when Aisha, Talha, and Zubair fought Ali ibn Abi Talib, what do you say about them? He said, yes, 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 they fought him, but they asked Allah for forgiveness afterwards. He said, them fighting him is a recognized event. And them asking for forgiveness is a narrated event. The recognized always goes above the narrated. Straight away he said to him, you come here. Come here. What's your name? He gave him his name. He said, no, 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 no. From now on you are Al-Mufid. Because you've given me an area of knowledge I never knew about. Therefore you have been useful to me. Your title is now Shaykh Al-Mufid. In other words, what do we find? We find that that disrespect to Rasulullah from this incident, the Quran narrated, not Hadith. The Quran said in Surah 66 that these wives plotted against him. Question, therefore, did Ali ibn Abi Talib also have disrespect for Fatima or no? Because people come over to say, Ali ibn Abi Talib showed no akhlaq to Fatima al-Zahra. Say, what do you mean? Say, Sahih al-Bukhari, there's a Hadith that Rasulullah was angered by Ali ibn Abi Talib. So which hadith? Says the hadith, Fatima is a part of me. Whoever angers her, angers me. Ali ibn Abi Talib angered Rasulullah, that's why he said this. So what do you mean? Hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, do you know what it says? The hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari says that Ali ibn Abi Talib heard Fatima al zahra How? He wanted to marry Abu Jahl's daughter Juwayriya. Try and comprehend this. Ali wants to have Abu Jahl as his father-in-law. Ali ibn Abi Talib wants to marry Abu Jahl's daughter Juwayriya. So he asks Harith al Makhzumi, Harith, can you go to Rasulullah and tell him that I want to marry Abu Jahl's daughter and see what he says? And this, this is interesting the way they narrate it. So Harith went to Rasulullah and said, Oh Muhammad, I am the, uh, from the tribe of Bani Makhzum. I have come with a proposal. 
Ali bin Abi Talib wants to marry Juwayriya. Rasulullah looked at him and said, How dare you say this? I just about let Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi' marry Zainab, my step-daughter, on the basis he doesn't marry anyone else. And now Ali wants to marry someone while he's married to Fatima. Wallah, la adhan, la adhan, la adhan. I do not accept, I do not accept, I do not accept. Because Fatima is a part of me. Whoever angers her, angers me. And whoever angers me, angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then what did he say? He said, I fear, I fear Fatima al-Zahra will leave the religion because Ali's made her angry. I sometimes, honestly, I wonder where they get these hadiths from. But then we say, okay, let's see who gave us this hadith. First person in the chain, Maswar ibn Makrama. Maswar ibn Makrama believed he passed puberty at the age of six. A bit difficult to listen to that guy when he talks. <laughs> Second person in the chain, Al Karabis al Baghdadi. Al Karabis al Baghdadi, every, for, every war, every war against Ali ibn Abi Talib, he fought. You think he's going to praise Ali ibn Abi Talib when he narrates the hadith? Every war against Ali ibn Abi Talib, Karabis al Baghdadi fought. He was a known Nasabi, hatred for Ali ibn Abi Talib. Number three, if Ali ibn Abi Talib this was going to marry anyone while he's married. Say he was going to. Abu Jahl's daughter. As in there's nobody else. Number four, Ali ibn Abi Talib. If this was a true marriage and he hurt Fatima. And he hurt Fatima. Then later on, Abu Bakr would have mentioned it. Omar would have mentioned it. At Jamal, they would have mentioned it. At Safin, they would have mentioned it. They would have said, you're the man who hurt the daughter of Rasulullah, isn't it? Never once did they mention Ali ibn Abi Talib hurting Fatima al-Zahra. On the contrary, all they would say is, we wish we were the ones accepted to marry Fatima. That's all they'd say. Ali ibn Abi Talib, on the contrary, with Fatima al-Zahra, you know what he'd show us? He'd show us that your akhlaq in your marriage is the most important thing in its success. If both of you have morals, that's the most important. Today when people ask me, said Ammar, if we want to get married, what should we look for? Should it be someone who is very religious? I said, no, first someone who's got good akhlaq, because then they're willing to become more religious. Someone who's already too religious, you may find them saying, I'm the best, nobody's as good as me, no one can change me. Someone who's got good akhlaq, you may find you can go on a spiritual journey with them. Amir al Mu'mineen and Fatima al Zahra, do you know what type of manners these two had with each other? As in, you think there was a better relationship in the history of the religion of Islam than Khadija and Muhammad and Fatima and Ali? Amir al-Mu'mineen comes home one day. He sees his wife Fatima with her eyes virtually inside the socket. He's saying to her, oh Fatima, why is your face so pale? She replies, oh son of Abu Talib, do not worry. He said, no, no, Fatima, tell me please, why, is your, why are your eyes so pale? Why is your face so pale? She said, oh son of Abu Talib, for two days we haven't had any food. He said, Fatima, why didn't you tell me? She said, because my father told me, never hurt Ali ibn Abi Talib. Today, the father-in-law, he sees his daughter as rude. He says, why are you being rude to my daughter? He says, your daughter is being rude. Rasulullah would tell his daughter, don't be rude to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Don't be hurt. Love Ali ibn Abi Talib. Protect him. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, oh my darling Fatima, what's wrong? You should have told me. Imam Amir al muminin left the house. When he left the house, on his way, he saw Miqdad walking. When he saw Miqdad walking, Imam Ali, as soon as he saw Miqdad, Salaamu Alaikum, Alaikum as -salam, he continued, Miqdad said, wait, wait. Imam Ali said, wait, Miqdad, what's wrong with you? You just left me. He said, Imam Ali, Wallah, my children have had nothing to eat. Imam Ali had just got one dinar loan to go and buy food for Fatima. He gave Miqdad the one dinar. He went to Rasulullah's mosque, Maghrib Salah, finished the Salah, Rasulullah turned around. He said, where's my son-in-law? Imam Ali came near him. He said, I want to come to you and Fatima's house for dinner tonight. I took money to go and get food. Now my father-in-law wants to come home, there's no food. And you know that moment when you take a friend home and the wife opens the door and you're like, he's come with me and she gives you that look. You know that look. 
He said to her, your dad has come to eat. She looked at him, then she said, let him come in. But her faith in Allah was so high that when she went and entered the kitchen, she read the dua Nabi Isa read when his disciples said, bring food from heaven. Nabi Isa, when the disciples said, can your Lord send food from heaven? The Quran revealed Surah Al-Ma'idah. You know, Al-Ma'idah is the food for Jesus. So she said, Ya Allah, Jesus, son of Mary, when he needed food, you sent him food from the heavens. Mary, his mother, when she needed food, you would send Jibra'il to her to give her food. Ya Allah, I am Fatima, daughter of Muhammad. And my father has come. And I didn't want to trouble my husband. Ya Allah, anzil alayna ma'idatan min as-sama'i. Takunu lana eidan li awalina wa akhirina. At that moment, the narration says, Jibra'il came with food from Jannah for Fatima al-Zahra. You therefore find that Ali ibn Abi Talib, this rumor that Ali ibn Abi Talib heard Fatima al-Zahra, never. Ali ibn Abi Talib, his whole life was an example. And that's why it was no surprise that his son, Aba Abdullah, would be the embodiment of morals towards his wives as well. Isn't it? Do you know how difficult it was for those wives to lose a husband like Imam al Hussein on the 10th of Muharram? When you had a husband like Abi Abdullah, who were his wives who were with him on the 10th of Muharram? The first of them was Rabab. Rabab, her father Amr ibn Qais, was a Christian. And he became a Muslim. He had three daughters, Mahiyat, Hayat, and Rabab. Mahiyat, Imam Ali married her. Hayat, Imam Al Hassan married her. Rabab, Imam Al Hussein married her. And on the 10th of Muharram, Rabab gave away the six month old baby. His other wife was Umm Ishaq bin Talha. She was originally married to Imam Hassan. Imam Hassan, before he died, he said, Abba Abdullah, this lady is going to be a widow. She's a brilliant human being. Look after her. She came. Third wife, Layla, daughter of Abi Murrah, son of Urwa, son of Mas'ud al Thaqafi. Layla was a phenomenal lady. Her family, Banu Thaqif, this was the most prestigious of Arab families. Her family, the good, the bad, and the ugly all came out of it. From her family, Mukhtar al Thaqafi. But also from her family, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. And it's normal in life. A prophet may have good and bad. Layla, from her mom's side, she's Layla, daughter of Maymuna, daughter of Abu Sufyan. Layla is Abu Sufyan's granddaughter. Muawiyah is her uncle. Yazid is her first cousin. And that's why on the 10th of Muharram, Yazid said, don't kill Ali al-Akbar. He's my cousin. His mom is my first cousin. Leave him. And Ali al-Akbar looked at them when they said that to him, seeing his dad alone. So from one side, the other side, her dad, Abi Murrah, was the son of Urwa bin Mas'ud. Urwa bin Mas'ud, Rasulullah used to say, is the mu'min of Al Yasin. He is the man who came to Islam, told his tribe about Islam, and they killed him. So Layla, from every side, Layla was a prestigious woman, and she only gave, she only had one son with Abi Abdullah, just one. But that son was a beacon of light on the earth. I tell you, that son, Ali Al Akbar, from a young age, from a young age, she used to love him so much. Why? The Hadith tells us, you know, when he was young. He'd say, Mommy, Mommy, let there be smoke come out of our chimney. She'd say to him, Why, my darling? He'd say, So if there's any poor people walking, they know we're cooking. So then the poor can come and eat with us. How hard for a mom to lose a son like that, honestly. And that's why, you know, when they paraded the heads in Kufa, the people of Kufa, when they saw Ali al Akbar, they saw Qasim's head, they saw Abbas's head, they saw Hussein's head. Many of the people in Kufa, they'd look at Ali al Akbar's head and they're like, We hope his mother never saw him die. Because how could a mother see a son with that face die? 
And that's why Rasulullah, the narrations tell us, Ali al-Akbar, Imam al Hussein said, the closest person in his appearance and his akhlaq and his intellect to Rasulullah was Ali al-Akbar. And you know when he came out on a battlefield, they called out, is that Ali al-Akbar or is that Rasulullah? And it was difficult, I tell you. Aba Abdullah, the narrations tell us the first of Bani Hashim to die was Ali al-Akbar. First of them to die was Ali al-Akbar. And how difficult was it for Rasulullah, for the grandson of Rasulullah, on the morning of the 10th of Muharram, Ali al-Akbar got up, he recited the Adhan. And imagine you hear your son recite the Adhan for the last time in your life. Tonight is a night for fathers and mothers. One of the maraja saw Imam al Hussein once in a dream. When he saw him in the dream, he saw arrows all over Imam al Hussein's body. This marja narrates that I woke up, I was crying and crying. I couldn't believe I saw Imam al Hussein with so many arrows. It says the next day I saw in my dream Imam al Hussein again, but with only two arrows on his body. I said, Ya Aba, I said, Ya Aba Abdullah, yesterday I saw your body full of arrows. Today I see only two. He said, the tears of my followers wipe away all the pains on my body. But there are two pains that remain with me forever. Abbas and Ali al-Akbar. Those two remain with me. And that's why those of you who go to Karbala, the six-month-old baby is on the chest of Imam al Hussein. And Ali al-Akbar is by the feet of his father. And he recited the Adhan on the 10th of Muharram. The narrations mentioned that he came towards his father. Do you know, brothers and sisters, I've read hadiths. Every companion of Imam al-Hussein, Imam would beg him, don't go to fight. Please, they want to kill me. Except Ali al-Akbar. It's as if he knew, that's it. I can't tell this boy anymore. He has to go. He hugged him and the narrations mentioned when he hugged him, they couldn't stop crying because they knew it's the final time. I wonder those of you who've lost a son or know of a person who's lost a son, how difficult is it to see your son in his last moments? How difficult? Imagine, especially a son so young. He hugged him, he embraced him, they began to cry. Ali al-Akbar rode his horse. When he rode his horse, he was just about to leave. Imam al Hussein said to him, he said, Ali, come back down. He said, what is it, my father? He said, go and bid farewell to your mother, Layla. It's difficult for her. He walked towards his mother, he entered. As soon as he entered, he entered and he hugged his mother, Layla. Then he looked at his auntie Zainab. And he saw his auntie Zainab crying. Zainab, Zainab, he looked towards Zainab. <coughs> when he looked towards Zainab, he went and embraced her, then he came back and he came to Aba Abdullah, he embraced Aba Abdullah, he rode his horse. As the horse was moving, Aba Abdullah stopped him, he said, Dad, why did you stop me again? He said, my son, you do not know how it feels for a father to bid farewell to his son. May Allah never show you this moment where you say goodbye to your son. May Allah never show us a moment where our son leaves the house, doesn't come home. He said, you'll never know how it feels to bid farewell to a son. He came back down out of respect for his dad. He loved his dad. Out of respect for his dad, he came off the horse, he came, he hugged his dad. Then he came out, he rode that horse, he went towards the middle of the battlefield. They say one of the harshest skirmishes that happened was Ali al-Akbar with the opposition. Narrations mention that over 80 soldiers he killed. And every time he'd kill, he'd turn around and he'd say, Assalamu alaykum ya Aba Abdullah. Layla was in the tent. Only Allah knows how a mother's heart feels when her son's in the middle of a battle. Layla was in the tent. Layla can't tell what's happening. So do you know how she would know? She'd look at the face of Imam al Hussein. If she sees Imam al Hussein smiling, that means she knows Ali is okay. She looked towards the face of Abi Abdullah. 
She looked towards him, she said to him, I see a change in the complexion of your face. Has something happened to my darling Ali? He looked towards her, he said, Layla, I could see someone coming to kill him. But Layla, the dua of the mother Allah accepts. Layla, read a dua and Ali will return. That dua remains a beautiful one. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, you return Ismail back to Hajar. Ya Allah, you return Yusuf back to Yaqub. Ya Allah, return Ali back to me. Before she knew it, within a moment, Ali Al Akbar was back. He came back. He entered. He hugged his mother. Then he went to his father. He said, Father, are you proud of me? He looked at him. He said, My son, I'm proud of you. Of course I am. He said to him, My father, Wallah, the armor is killing me. My father, the heat of Karbala is burning me. Is burning me. My father, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Abba Abdullah, do you know what he did? He took his tongue out and placed it on Akbar's tongue. Do you know what Akbar replied to him? Oh my father, your tongue is drier than mine. Then Abba Abdullah said to him something. He said to him, Oh Akbar, go back out. In a moment your grandfather Rasul Allah will quench your thirst. He went back out towards the battlefield. They began to attack him from every angle. All of a sudden, men came from every angle and struck him on the ground. He called out, Oh my father, come and help me. Do you know what the narrations mention? The narrations mention Abba Abdullah. When he heard Akbar call him, he came out, but he went in the wrong direction. Sukaina looked at Imam Al Hussein and she said to him, My dad, why are you going in that direction? Ali is over there. He looked at her and he said to her, Oh Sukaina, Oh Sukaina, Oh Sukaina, do not blame me, I cannot see because your brother's death is killing me. Every hadith says, When Abba Abdullah saw someone die, he'd run. But when he went to Ali Akbar, he was walking. Do you know why? He found it difficult to run. The pain had affected him. He came towards Ali Akbar's body and he sat by him. When he came near him, he heard him say, Assalamu alaikum ya Abu Abdullah. But he only saw him say salam with one hand, not with two. He came near him. He wondered why is Ali saying salam with one hand? He then realized Ali was covering the dagger that was in his chest with his other hand. Abu Abdullah, when he removed the dagger, he turned towards the land of Najaf. Why? Why the land of Najaf? He turned round towards the land of Najaf and he said, Oh my father Ali ibn Abi Talib. You had to lift the gate of Khaybar, but you never had to lift a dagger from the chest of your son. Come to Karbala and see what I've got to do now. <clears throat> MashaAllah, MashaAllah, lovers of Akbar. But this is the line that hurts the most. When Abba Abdullah saw Ali Al Akbar in his final moments, he said to him, Oh my son Ali, I see you smile, I see you smile, but I also see you cry. Oh my son Ali, why do you smile and why do you cry? Listen to the reply. He said to him, Oh my father Abba Abdullah, I smile because I see my grandfather Rasul Allah coming towards me. I see him coming towards me and he's about to give me from the pool. Then he looked at him, he said, Ali, then why do you cry? He said, I cry, I cry, I cry because I see my grandmother Fatima Zahra in front of me. But why do you cry? He said, because I see my grandmother Fatima Zahra.
and I see her looking into your face and for every time that you cry I see her slap her cheeks in front of me We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and al-Muhammad to allow us to be amongst those who follow the example of Rasulullah. Allow us to be amongst those who honor the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Allow us to be with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa sallam. Inshallah tomorrow will be the night of Ashura. May Allah bless all of you for your pledges last night. It was a phenomenal contribution. And for those who haven't pledged, then those $72 will allow Ali Al-Akbar's name to remain with us forever. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Surah Al-Fatiha, but before it the loudest of your salawat.